I recently had the honor of being asked to contribute to an AEBG publication, Andy and Structural Styles, a Seismic Atlas. My chapter was on challenges in seismic imaging in fold and thrust belts, and I'd like to spend the next 15 minutes demonstrating some of the fundamental concepts that we discuss in the chapter. Basically, the theme of my talk today is uh, that seismic imaging in the Andes is only for the tough geoscientist. Seismic data in complex structure areas like the Andes is characterized by a low data density, high noise content, and high geologic complexity. Rough topography and near surface weathering obscure the subsurface. Sometimes I wonder why we bother with seismic data in these rough areas, but with a lot of collaboration between the geoscience team, then we can actually find some good uh, uh, expression of success and image the really interesting subsurface structures. Now when we image those structures, it's seismic migration that creates the final image for interpretation. Pre-stack time migration, or PSTM, is the robust method in our toolkit, but the positioning is approximate and the data is in time. And of course we want to see the structure in depth. Pre-stack depth migration, on the other hand, is more accurate, great, but it requires a more accurate velocity model. It's a more delicate process. So then we need to get a collaboration with a structural geologist and with a seismic interpreter and understand the regional geologic setting uh, in order to get imaging success in these areas or overcome these limitations. So let's step back and think about this, uh, the seismic experiment We've got our source up in the near surface and our wave as it's propagating down into the subsurface, our, our downgoing wave. And uh, as it, well, the wave goes down, it, it's going to bounce off of these different interfaces. So we've got this echo, uh, this reflection coming off this uh, red reflector indicated by these little arrows. And we've got a, a reflector coming off the yellow interface at, uh, it's, it's already making its way at this late time. It's making its way back up to the surface. So let's watch this as this wave propagates into the subsurface. So right away, we're going to see a reflection off of this fault plane, nice big, big, strong reflector. And, um, and then the wave is going to propagate into the subsurface and reflect off of the, the yellow layer and then reflect off of the red layer. And this is our energy as it's propagating up toward the surface from the, the deeper uh, red reflector. And as it comes to the surface, it's going to come to the surface at an earlier time over here because it's going through higher velocity material. And it's going to come to the surface at a later time over here because it's going through lower velocity material. And that's what, what death migration is going to do is going to correct for those time delays um, uh, and shortening of time with, uh, with the velocity of the subsurface. But first, let's step back and think about what we're actually recording in the field. Um, you can see when these uh, rough topography environments, we've got a lot of surface waves and, and a lot of noise, so much noise on our seismic section. And, um, and a lot of this noise, particularly the surface waves, are reasonably predictable in their character. So then they fair, they're fairly easy to remove without removing the reflection energy. So these are the reflectors that we want to uh, eventually image the subsurface uh, targets. And, uh, and you can see we're starting to reveal them once we strip away the layers of the noise. Still some, lots of noise left, as you can see. There are other processes along the way that will reduce this noise. And, um, but uh, we want to be very careful at this stage. If we get rid of all of the noise, then at some point we'll start to remove some of the reflection energy. And as you can see here by the dim, uh, dim reflectors here and in, in, the, in the, the dimness of the amplitude of the reflection energy on the movie we just watched, um, it, these are very delicate and we definitely do not want to remove any reflection energy. So next we'll have a look at, um, at a, a stack section of the subsurface and we're, we just want to look at the effects of, of the near surface weathering. You can see with the topography here, we've got uh, uh, rocks that are more resistant to weathering, rocks that are more susceptible to weathering. So you can imagine we would have the lateral variation in velocity as you go from firm rocks to soft ground. And, um, and then out on the foreland side, we might get these time delays because of the low velocity in the near surface. 
And that's that is characterized here uh, when we correct for the weathering. We can see the this, the uh, the reflector shifts up in time because we remove the time delay of the weathering. Also, we've got improved reflector coherency. So that's cool, but I think what's more important is the subthrust target over here before we've corrected for this near surface variability in weathering. And after, you can see we've got a lot more reflectivity to work with or future steps of the process. Now, one of the most important future steps in this process is migration. And migration is moving the reflection energy from the, from the where it's recorded uh, into its reflector position. So this is a stack section. So what happens when, before we've migrated is that the anticline ends up looking quite broad, but wider than it should. It's got these diffraction energy coming off the side of it. And then we've got a syncline over here, and all this energy is, uh, is crisscrossing down uh, into, the, into the core of the syncline. So we need to migrate these up, up and over. Um, and so that's what we're going to see here with this movie is that we can, we can uh, migrate the data and then over migrate and then reduce the migration and under migrate and then somewhere in between we're going to find a, a migration velocity that uh, gives us a fairly reasonably looking geologic shape to the anticline and syncline in, in, this, uh, in this image. Now this is the kind of thing that geophysics jokes are made out of. Well, how big do you want your structure and what do you want to see in the subsurface? And, uh, and thankfully, when we actually pick velocities, the, uh, the actual coherency of the data changes with pre-stack time migration. So if we look at this uh, velocity picking session, that's what I'm, I'm going to show you now in this, in this next movie, We've got a constant velocity pre-stack time migration panels on the left, and this is a very low velocity. So we've got the, the near surface reflectors, the image really quite nicely, but we've got very low coherency in the deep section. So we know that we can't use this really low velocity to image the whole subsurface because the, the reflectors aren't stacking in. And the image on the right, this is the composite image. And as we make velocity picks, this, is, this will get updated real time. So now I'm going to move you through, go to higher velocity, way too high. Lower velocity, mm, too low. And then find something in between where we've got optimized imaging over the anticline. Now I can make some picks in here, and you can see the image on the right gets updated real time as I make these picks. The syncline is a bit trickier. We're trying to find something optimized in the base of the syncline, and oh, we found it. And then we come climb up the side limb, out of the syncline, and we've got this optimized image. Now, this is this this is the um, uh, the velocity panel on the left that images that optimizes this this image uh, for the side limb of the syncline, but it's too high of velocity to image very well on the near surface. But the composite image uh, com composites all of the um, of the velocity picks that we make, and we can see we've got good reflectivity all the way throughout the section. I've just compressed hours worth of work down into 30 seconds. Um, and, and of course, the, the geologic input here is very important because what we want to do is want to see if, uh, if these shapes make geologic sense. Do we expect to see folds? Do we expect to see faults? What, uh, what do we expect to see the, the structural shapes of the subsurface to be while we're picking these pre stack time migrations? Now the velocities themselves are difficult to QC because we, this, this uh, robustness that we have that we can average through all of the velocity effects of the near surface in order to uh, movie through and find our optimum image results in some funny looking velocities. And that's fine because what we're doing is that we're just averaging through all of the effects of heterogeneity and anisotropy in order to optimize the imaging uh, with our pre-stack time migration. So here's our anticline syncline pair again. And uh, notice below the anticline, we've got lower velocity. So the warmer colors are higher velocity and the cooler colors are low velocity. And relatively speaking, uh, the crest of the anticline down here has uh, a, lower, a lower velocity than the rocks around it. And it wouldn't, um, but, uh, but what's happening is this is the average velocity through the near surface down to this imaging point. Over here below the syncline, the same rock layers show very high. Uh, velocity. And if we think about how we're averaging through the near surface, it actually makes makes some sense. So what's happening here is we've got 
the velocity in the direction parallel to bedding is higher than the direct velocity perpendicular to bedding. And that bedding orientation changes across the section. So if we're imaging below the anticline, then this ray path that represents the source reflection point receiver ray path, this runs fairly close to normal to bedding throughout its, uh, its offset range. So it's going to see the lowest velocity, the, the velocity normal to bedding. And over here on the right, and with the, below the syncline, uh, it's below the same rocks, but it's, uh, these rays are running at angles oblique to bedding, or a higher uh, move up velocity, uh, because of the, of the velocity change with respect to direction. So that's how we end up with this velocity variation with uh, laterally along the, thing, along the section, because we're averaging through the near surface effects. Now, seismic anisotropy is an interesting study in its own right. There are a few ca uh, causes of it. It's the, the alignment of uh, the minerals in the shale, also interbedding. And I think there's, a, a, there's a, an interesting way to look at the interbedding effect. In my kitchen, I've got a, a sponge that has a, a, a fairly firm layer in it. So like, you know, when the scrubbing gets tough, and also, it's got this nice soft layer. Let's say I've spilt my coffee and I just need to swipe, wipe it up. Now, these two layers kind of interact with each other. When I squeeze them, they both uh, compress together. This, I think it's easier to think of this in terms of a, a sequence of strata. Now, if I'm trying to compress these layers uh, normal to bedding, it's fairly easy to compress because the yellow layers are very compressible. So I'm having no problem compressing it in the direction normal to bedding. So it would have a low compressional velocity. However, if I try to compress these layers uh, parallel to bedding, uh, then I'm having a, diff having a difficult time getting those layers to compress. So it's more incompressible. It was a higher uh, compressional velocity in the direction parallel to bedding. Now, the other thing to note is in terms of the, uh, uh, in terms of the uh, orientation of bedding, in a thrust belt environment, it's rare that we just have simply horizontal layers. In fact, we usually have uh, quite the dramatic variation in dip in our near surface. And we need to build that into our depth migration velocity model. So we build a geologic model uh, with a structural interpretation. Um, and uh, we do expect these velocities to follow the geologic trends. We expect to have a geologic justification for any time we have variability along the section. So these little numbers indicate the velocity of the model. Again, warmer colors are higher velocities. And, uh, and the numbers are oriented in the direction parallel to bedding. So this is the 3,703 meters per second. And that's the direction perpendicular to bedding. And uh, we've got about a 10 to 12% higher velocity in the direction parallel to bedding. And so, when we correct for all of these effects of heterogeneity and anisotropy, then, then we can get a more accurate picture of the subsurface. And it, it, it's a very delicate uh, process. So if we, have, if we put too much high velocity in the hanging wall, for example, then we are going to, uh, the imaging is going to break down in the deep section. So let's look at comparison between a pre-stack time migration and pre-stack depth migration for this data set. Now let's start over on the left with this anticline. Uh, the assumptions uh, are averaging through the near surface with uh, with the pre-stack time migration. They don't they're, they're, they should hold reasonably accurately. So then, when we look at the pre-stack time migration versus pre-stack depth migration, then we've got a very similar perspective. The pre-stack time migration is doing a good job on the anticline, um, and the pre-stack depth migration may have a little bit more detail in the deep section. It's really quite a, a similar, uh, a similar imaging um, between the two algorithms. Um, in the syncline, however, as we saw those well, these issues we have imaging below a syncline, um, the pre-stack time migration is breaking down because we've got all these Im imaging rays that, that that we use to image the subsurface are going through all of this variability in dip. So then, uh, then the imaging is breaking down through the syncline, and we have a difficult time actually imaging through the syncline and below it. Whereas the pre-stack depth migration, uh, we're able to get a really nice image through the syncline and below it. And actually, then the deeper layers 
still in the syncline, but in the, in the deeper within the syncline. And then actually, if we look over here uh, to the right below the overthrusts, uh, this is where the, the pre-stack time migration is, is really broken down. We've got a syncline, and we've got a big velocity inversion across the overthrust, and the imaging is just, is just strange in here with some kind of potentially velocity pull up. Um, and then now with the depth migration, we've got a much better, uh, much better image of this, lots of interesting structural detail in the footwall side of this thrust. So to conclude, structural complexity increases the difficulty in seismic imaging of subsurface reflectors. Pre-stack time migration is a robust tool for areas where we have limited understanding of the subsurface structure. Pre-stack depth migration gives us a more accurate picture of the subsurface, but we need a geologically accurate model in order to image these subsurface reflectors. So then we need to have a geologic understanding and collaboration with the, the geology team uh, and those are the key levers to success in seismic imaging of the Andes. We just are more successful when we work together.